the curse is over. Let's go. After what six straight losses during KFS watch parties, the Knicks finally pull off a win. Um, shout out to everyone that joined KFS over at T Squared Social um, down in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. So I could not be there in person. I was there in spirit. I'm sure it was a great time for all. And the Knicks came out with a victory, which to me um, just feel good about everyone that uh, showed up to Andrew and. John and the KFS crew that have been going to these things um, and seeing a lot of losing, they finally see a win that for a little bit was a bit hairy. You know, there was, uh, I'm, I'm sure all of us felt at some point in that third quarter, like, is this going to be that letdown game after a, you know, a tough road trip, a tough turnaround, but the Knicks pulled it off in the end with um, smothering defense and absolutely sublime play by their role players. and. I kind of just want to start right there because since Jalen Brunson came on board, it's been a lot of him just lifting this team up. He's done it with his play, which obviously speaks for itself. He is going to be an all NBA player this year. Um, he is, he has every right to be in a conversation uh, to be uh, as one of the 10 best, most impactful players in the entire NBA. He has picked this team up time and time again with his, his scoring, with his ability to just, be there when this team needs him. And for the first time in a while, he needed someone else to pick him up. And the Knicks role players, led by Deuce McBride, Dante DiVincenzo, Isaiah Hartenstein, and then Josh Hart in the second half of that game, they picked him up. Uh, Jalen Brunson went 7 of 24 from the field. I thought that he really did not perform well against how the, the Nets, and credit to them, I mean, they they – varied their coverages up uh, on these high pick and rolls. There was a lot of uh, Nick Claxton switching onto him. There was a lot of hedging, a lot of drop. Um, Brunson really didn't handle that well. He didn't get good looks. The 7 of 24, I thought, yes, he missed a few shots that probably he makes more times than not. But in the in the end, to me, I thought the Nets played an absolute great defensive game against him. Credit to Kevin Ollie for coming up with a really great uh, game plan to slow him down. And you just wondered how the Knicks are going to generate offense. And through most of the game, it was really Deuce McBride just making shots. Six of 12 um, from the three-point line. Another um, just phenomenal game from him. Slowed down Cam Thomas. Played the entire game. I mean, we just to do that time and time again, um, to play at these uh, this level of uh, minutes, to play against some of the best defensive player, uh, offensive players uh, on that end and guard them, make shots, uh, just phenomenal. So he he obviously performed well through most of that game, but they needed someone else to sort of take the reign offensively. And it was Dante DiVincenzo. I mean, his performance inside the arc, eight of 11 uh, from two point range. Um, he has been a revelation this year, his shooting, his uh, ability to get up just in insane three point uh, frequency, but there's, there had been a sort of slowdown for him and you wondered it, was it a fatigue issue? Was this um, sort of a little bit of a regression um, back for him? But for him to do what he did inside the arc, finishing with craft, I thought he, you know his ability to get downhill was um, really impressive. And his finishing, which has been you know something that he has not been elite at this year, it's been a, it's been a struggle at times. He performed really really well in that area, and the Knicks needed every one of those baskets, especially in the second half. It's just an incredible performance. Um, by him. And then Isaiah Hartenstein is sort of the other guy that you just, you, you wonder where this team would be without him. Uh, it was a, another performance from him, uh, 17 points, nine rebounds, four steals. His defense was as usual impactful uh, in the first half. There was a few occasions where the Nets had two on one advantages. He's the one and he's deflecting balls and he's just disrupting some of the actions that they have at the rim and his ability to move the ball and his chemistry with Brunson continues to be something that has been flourishing more and more as the season has gone on. And that, again, showed itself. Brunson did have eight assists, so credit to him for at least adjusting in that way and generating some looks for his teammates. Uh, I believe it was 20 points on those eight assists, so he's, he's generating good looks for his teammates. A lot of that is him getting downhill, Hartenstein moving, and those two have that chemistry now where he can drop that ball off and, and they can generate a good look. So a uh, nice performance uh, by Hartenstein again. And 
you know, it's, it's again, one of those situations where you just, I felt, is this going to be a game where the Knicks are just not going to generate enough looks? Because I was wondering, like, how are they going to adjust to how the Nets are guarding Brunson? And they did, to their credit, go to more of that guard-to-guard screening to try to get Claxton out of the action because what the Nets were doing was basically just switching those pick and rolls. And and Brunson, who has not been a great isolation player this year, certainly not as good as he was last year, it's a bit of a, you know, I wouldn't call that a major concern, but it, it is something to uh, to make note of as we move along uh, towards the end of the season into the playoffs, like he has not been a great isolation player. So it's just not a strong area for the Knicks to get efficient looks. And the Nets knew that, and they know Claxton is very good guarding on the perimeter. So they were more than happy to allow Brunson to pound the ball and try to get looks against their, against one of the better defenders in the NBA. And the Knicks and Brunson especially just didn't adjust well enough to that in the first half. The second half, again, more guard to guard screening. There was one play actually where Claxton pre switches um, that, and I tweeted about it because he just wanted to be in the action. So he switched with the whoever the guard was next to trying to get into that play. He switches, and now uh, Claxton is the is the switch man to isolate against Brunson, and, and he forced a forced a miss. But you know, for Brunson to go seven of twenty four, and the Knicks to still perform well enough to win this game is a is a testament to this um, to this team and the. Ability to just do this um, time and time again, where you just don't think they have another level to get to. There isn't a lot of creation on this team. So if Brunson is not the guy doing it, then especially in the half court, it could be a slog. And, you know, there was there was a few times where they got out in early offense and able to push the ball. I thought, you know, as soon as I tweeted about Josh Hart, just not having the verb uh, uh, today, um, just not really you weren't seeing his name uh, um you know, his name wasn't being mentioned. He weren't really noticing his impact on the game, especially in that first half and about, you know, two, three minutes into that third quarter. And you were wondering, you know, is this like a fatigue thing? Is there just something going on with him? But it, it, it just kind of flipped with him. He had that one transition layup. And beyond that, it was the offensive rebounding. Um, it was uh, the rebounding in general, the ability to push the ball up the court. Really good second half for him, especially in that fourth quarter. I thought he was a big key to ha- to for the Knicks to pull this game away. And if there's any stat you can look at to sort of represent how dominant the Knicks were at the end of this game, it's the second chance points. I had looked it up. I think the Knicks were 26 to three uh, edge and second and second chance points. Um, that is a massive advantage. It is, you know, what this team is, you know, one of their main advantages when they go into these games uh, is the second chance uh, points. And to me, it was more of the, not just the finishing on the putbacks, it's the gender getting the rebound. And then kicking it out for threes. Hartenstein had two of them in the in the first half. Hart had one um, late in the fourth quarter to sort of it was kind of the nail in the coffin type uh, uh, play to kick it out for a three. Big performance by him. The Knicks were just tougher than the Nets down the stretch. And then you know we know the Nets lack creation. You know Mikael Bridges really isn't the guy that you could, that can lead an offense when the uh, things are bogging down in the second in the in in the half court and they need to get offense he's not really the guy to do that when you get into him and into his dribble and force him to make plays one on one the nets went 11 straight misses in the fourth quarter at one point uh 2 of 15 overall in the fourth quarter for the nets until they brought in their their reserves the game had pretty much uh ended by then uh so I'd just say the Knicks are really smothering in that fourth quarter dominating the game and to, to me, to do that with Brunson performing the way he did is just a big time performance uh, when you know he's been the guy to do that for this team year uh, the last two years. So to pick him up to me was a nice thing to see. And there was a, there was times in that in that second half where the I felt better about some of the non Brunson shots than the Brunson shots, which I can't remember a game where I felt that way, where I wanted someone other than Jalen Brunson to take that, that look. Um, part of that is not just the fact that Brunson wasn't handling how the Nets were defending him. Well, you know, if you, if Brunson is not generating looks, good looks for himself in a one-on-one or a pick and roll situation, who's the guy that really do that on the Knicks with the current roster that they have right now? There was one play where I think it was Josh Hart pushed the ball and they got it and Brunson got a transition three that was he was able to step into. It was a very good look. And that was, I think, the only one that he got that was so, that was generated by his teammates that I would that would consider like a really good, high quality look. So that's that's part of the thick the, the situation that the Knicks are dealing with here is that you have a guy like Brunson who is 
has been excellent, uh, obviously, as a pick and roll uh, maestro, um, but really doesn't have another guy on his team currently until Julius uh, Randall comes back to get him those looks that are just easier in the flow of the offense. And tonight was sort of the microcosm of him trying to take advantage of some switches that, you know, maybe he thought against uh, uh, Claxton that that's a, that's a mismatch in his advantage, but it really isn't. I and mean, Claxton is that good. And so if he's not going to generate high quality looks for himself, um, and again, credit to the Nets for defending him in that way, then who's going to do that? So this is for uh, for him. Uh, the Knicks really don't have that guy on the roster right now to consistently help Jalen Brunson get him good looks, allow him to to get some easy catch and shoot uh, threes, which to me, you know, since Julius went down, that's been the biggest thing the Knicks have had to adjust to in terms of how they've had to change things because they don't have that gravitational force allowing uh, their three-point shooters to sort of like relocate and uh, play around the Julius Randle post-ups or paint touches. They don't have that right now. And when Brunson is not going well and he's not getting downhill with uh, with uh, his pick-and-roll opportunities, he's not uh, generating really good looks out of isolation, there's, there's just not a lot for him uh, to go off. The Knicks continue to move him off ball some, but I didn't, I didn't think they generated really good offense uh, with those as well. So the Nets are really aggressive on a lot of the DHOs the Knicks are running. They do a lot of zoom action for Brunson where you're setting a pin down on one side. He's going to come up for a dribble handoff. I thought the Nets did a good job of just staying aggressive, eliminating a lot of those plays and just staying attached to him. And the Nets have size. You know, there's a lot of guys that can throw at him. Uh, not That's not uh, Nick Claxton. That, you know, they're long wings that are that can play physical. I thought they gave him a lot of, a lot of trouble. But Brunson is going to have these games. He's going to have situations where the shot isn't falling, especially without Julius. There's going to be times where these looks are not going to fall because they're they're not like the highest quality shot attempts. And you're going to need your role players just to pick him up. And to me, it was DiVincenzo. It was McBride. It was uh, Hartenstein. And it was, uh, I thought, in the second half, a really, for the most part, good performance from Josh Hart. Um, before we uh, sort of uh, kick off the Super Chats, I do want to just sit with the performance from uh, McBride a bit. You know, he signed that extension, the three-year contract, and there was a sort of belief here that, you know, he's a rotation guard that is probably not a starter, and that all may be true. But if you just look at where he was to start the season and where he is now as a skilled ball player it is night and day there's times now where he can you know the finishing with the left hand he had one um today uh on a on a uh, transition opportunity finishing with the left his shooting out of the pick and roll he had one pick and roll three where he just steps in they're in drop he's he's shooting right into that drop pocket and and making it with confidence his ability to get up a high quality three-point looks with frequency i mean 12 three-point attempts granted he did play the whole game but you know, he is a guy that has shown to be highly aggressive. He's got a high release point, so he can get off looks that maybe a player of his size, you know, 6'1", 6'2", that has a lower release point is probably not going to be able to generate. But his his release point really benefits him in terms of getting up a ton of three-point looks. And he continues to sort of add to his game. And, and you know, there's the, the thing about him is like, is he a point guard? Is he not? You know, tonight or today, obviously, he wasn't your your point guard. He was he was your your two. Um, he's going to have some on ball reps, but not but not many. And he's just going to be more of a, a spacer, and he's going to defend the best player in the other team. And I thought his defense on Cam Thomas was as good as you can hope for. I mean, Cam is going to hit shots that are just he's one of the better tough shot makers in the NBA. But I thought Deuce did a great job of just making everything tough. Uh, Cam, he's, you know, he always scored his points, but they weren't efficient uh, points. I don't think there was there wasn't one moment of that game where I thought that Cam Thomas was going to go off and have a game where he's going to lead a team back because he is um, it, on a heater. I thought Deuce McBride played him in a way that was going to prevent that. Yeah, some buckets are going to he's going to score some because he is, like I said, that kind of shot maker. But there wasn't any moment where I thought that he can go off and get 35 points and steal a victory. And that's, uh, to me, a testament to how, you know, what I believe and I'm sure what the Knicks believe in him as a defensive player. Just a really big time performance on on both ends of, of for him. And a guy that I'm, you know, obviously there's going to be uh, a, a ceiling so we can we can look to maybe 
um, you know, talk about that. But to me, that it's it's more of like looking at him as a key rotation a rotation uh, piece for the next several years. And to me, that's gonna that's gonna be a lot of. Uh, point guard, a lot of back, uh, backup point guard option. That's going to be a lot of two guard. That's going to be a lot of versatility. Like if you told me the Knicks can now go the next three, four years and your backcourt, uh, your point guard is Jalen Brunson and your your nominal backup is Deuce McBride. To me, if you, you factor in some growth uh, for Deuce as a point guard, I think the Knicks would be very confident in that pairing for the next several years. To me, I, I feel personally very confident that he can be, you know, you don't have to be a traditional point guard anymore if you have enough creation, you know, around the, the, the other five on the, on the court. So I think Deuce has a lot to, to um, grow into, but to me, the growth from the beginning of the season to now has been ex- exponential. Um, so big time performance by him. Um, and then uh, Dante DiVincenzo, I already uh, talked about, you know, he's, there was that stretch when Julius and uh, Ananobi first went down and he was, you know, shooting 10 to 12 threes a night and, and making many of them and just really elevating the ceiling that we, you know, I didn't think he had, I don't think the Knicks thought they had. And you were wondering like, all right, how good is this guy? Um, there's been again, some regression here, but you, you always wonder like inside the arc, that's been my big concern with him. Like, is he able to generate enough offense if the three-pointer isn't falling? I don't know what he ended up, you know, at in terms of the three-point uh, percentage. He did miss a couple late uh, with the game already um, decided. But to me, you know, his three-point uh, shooting was hit or miss today. It was everything inside the arc that, to me, that was uh, was most impressive uh, for him. And that is not something that he has uh, been doing consistently this year. So that's just an area for him to sort of think about, like, if you're going to be a starting two guard in this league and you're going to be like a second or third option potentially on a good team, maybe fourth option, you know, we'll see, you know, how this team is built, but you're going to have to develop those other um, aspects to your game. And we've seen him develop as a three point shooter this year. The second piece for him is like, all right, how good can he be as a pick and roll operator? How good can he be as a finisher? Because those are things that have been a little spotty this year, but today they needed all the scoring inside the arc. And I mentioned it earlier, eight of 11, uh, from two point range, every one of those was absolutely crucial um, to help the Knicks pull out uh, this victory against um, the Nets. And then just wrapping up the um, you know the shout outs here, I Josh Hart. You know, I I when I sent the tweet about like where where was uh, the energy, the spirit for him? You know, I probably should have saw, uh, thought second a uh, second uh, for that and maybe pull back on that uh, post because to me, as soon as I sent it. He had that uh, fast break layup. And then beyond that, it was just like getting every loose ball, every offensive rebound, every defensive rebound, adding that energy um, that he continues to play with. You know, he's the shooting. We know there's there's pieces, especially as a half court player that are going to be leave a lot to be desired. Uh, The Knicks played a a double big lineup at one point. I mean, there's just a a lot of spacing concerns uh, currently for this Knicks team. when You're you're missing um, some of your guys. But to me, like his it felt like the energy that he played with in the, you know, midway through the third quarter until the end of the game helped jumpstart the team a little bit. Uh, He wasn't scoring like McBride. He wasn't scoring like DiVincenzo and he wasn't the overall impactful player that Hartenstein was, but I thought his, his spirit, his ability to sort of change the flow of the game and just get into guys. I thought his defense on Schroeder at times was really good. Just making things hard. Um, The Knicks at overall in the fourth quarter, I mean, they really tr- try to get into the nets. And, the, you know, I, I'd have to look back at a second watch to see, like, what offense the nets were actually running here. I mean, there was there were some pick and rolls. There were some, um, you know, but it, to me, it was like a lot of, like, one-on-one and trying to generate things. The ball was moving side to side, but there was no advantages um, being created. And that's, to me, it's like, that is the NBA right now. You have to get two to the ball, and then you have to take advantage on the on the four and three on the back end. And... The, the Nets never did that in the fourth quarter. It made the Nets, uh, the Knicks defense, which was extremely aggressive and the rotations were on point, but I think thought they made it pretty easy with how they were uh, going about their offense. So, you know, credit to, you know, the Knicks, you know, again, I mentioned, I kind of um, buried the lead a little bit on that turnaround. I mean, they got in late um, off the West coast trip. Um, they didn't get in until yesterday uh, around five o'clock, I believe. And to play a one o'clock game after that uh, West Coast trip, and maybe that sort of influenced how they performed a little bit uh, in that first first half. You know, wasn't they weren't at their zippiest, they weren't at their their most spry. You know, 
to me, the defense in the fourth quarter was a complete level up. So maybe it took them a little bit to sort of get into the game. And if you've watched the Knicks for, you know, as long as I have, and I'm sure, you know, we've seen enough of these Sunday or these uh, weekend uh, games at one o'clock. There are just a, it's a, it's an interesting sort of game to play against a team that you've beaten twice. You've not, you, you don't, you're not going to, that's not going to generate a lot of um, intensity just on their own. So it, you know, it's probably like not the worst case scenario that the Knicks didn't have their normal fight, but, but, you know, it's like Deuce McBride. I thought that kept them, you know, played, you know, did enough in the first half to sort of keep them in the game, keep them within striking distance. And then, and then when the Knicks tried to, you know, get it to you know level 10 on the defense, the Nets really couldn't generate any good looks. And that was a, a big key um, uh, to winning this game. So, Again, for Jalen Brunson to go seven of twenty-four, and the Knicks to still win this game, and for the Knicks to pick him up, and you know, he they put him on uh, their shoulders a little bit, and it's been obviously quite the opposite for now almost two years since um, he's come here, and and obviously changed the the face of this team. Uh, of this team, he's changed the outlook, the culture, everything has sort of been altered by Jalen Brunson's presence, and for all his his greatness. There's games where, you know, his size is a limitation. There's there's going to be times where teams are going to throw enough size on him, and without his running mate and Julius Randle, things can get tough. And when he's not generating those looks for him, they he needed someone else to uh, he needed multiple players uh, um, on the Knicks to sort of pick him up. And it was really cool to see that the Knicks were able to do that and do it well and perform at that level, and then win the game really going away. And it just felt like around the third quarter, early third, you know, it just felt like this was going to be a game. The Knicks are going to have to sweat out over the last, uh, you know, three, four minutes. And then you have, obviously, as I'm thinking, they have Cam Thomas on their team. He's renowned for just so, you know, the tough shot making and the ability to just get off a look late, late in the game. I just kept thinking about like, is that going to, is going to be the performance that we're going to have where, you know, the Knicks are going to keep it uh, too close to comfort. And then the Nets are going to hit a couple of threes late to sort of, excuse me, pull the game away at the end, but the Knicks uh, didn't allow that to happen. So their defense really um, put the stamp on this game and, and just made things extremely difficult and uh, led by, you know, Isaiah Hartenstein, who have talked about a little bit, but again, his, his defensive presence can't be understated here because, you know, without OG Ananobi, there is not elite defensive talent on this Nick roster. It's a, you know, there's some really good defenders. We talked about McBride and a heart and, I thought DiVincenzo uh, had a nice bounce back game defensively playing that free safety role and, and generating steals, but it's not a elite defensive um, team when OG and Ananobi is not there. A lot of the way the Knicks have been defending of late is that Hartenstein just seems healthy, seems healthy, as healthy as he's had uh, looked all year. That's a big thing for him. Um, still seems to be on a minute restriction. I didn't love the Achua minutes. Um yeah, I don't think we saw him in the in the second half. Maybe someone can uh, can check on that. But you know, it seemed like there was uh, more Sims in the second half than than Achua. So the Knicks are gonna have to figure this out because they. I didn't think that the minutes, other than um, Sims performing a little better in the second half, I didn't like the the non Hartenstein minutes at all for the Knicks bigs. But you know, maybe they could start to stretch him out a little bit um, to get those uh, minutes back to where they were early in the year. But also being cognizant of this Achilles has been something that has like flared up a, a couple of times this year. So maybe not the worst scenario for the Knicks to, to sort of massage this and keep this, keep his minutes, uh, you know, lower than normal through the rest of the regular season or these next, um, you know, four, uh, now three games where the, you, the opponents are not um, elite, certainly, and they can maybe get uh, a couple more of these wins before the schedule uh, gets a little bit uh, tougher. So, uh, with that, uh, I think we can uh, kick off the super chats. So um, obviously, always appreciating that. Um, KFS, as all of you know, is you know it's an independent independent media. So we, you know, your super chats and your contributions really keep us going. So if you like what we do here, um, your support is obviously much appreciated. Uh, we have a lot of great, uh, a lot of gratitude for all of you, sort of keeping us. Um, here and allowing us to do what we do and trying to bring you the best Knicks content that we we can. So, Kev, with that, we can hit our first uh, super chat. 
Exhibition continues. Thank you so much for your contribution as you kick us off here uh, post game as the Knicks uh, beat the Nets. Uh, they really had to fight in this game more than you thought. It's almost like they were exercising a curse. Yes. Well, LOL. Love KFS. Let's go next. Um, I had actually uh, messaged the KFS group because I wanted to get the actual uh, record. And it looks like 0-6 coming into this game in uh, for the live watch parties for KFS in the regular season. There was one win in the playoffs. 0-6 is 0-6. And as you guys are fully aware of, the Knicks have done a lot of winning um, over the past couple of years. So to, to be 0-6 had a lot of us wondering if the curse was indeed um, – Real, but that curse, uh, as uh, exhibition uh, continues, uh, notes may have been lifted, may have been exercised a bit uh, today, though. After the Cam Thomas uh, buzzer beater in the third, after the Mikhail Bridges buzzer beater from three quarters court in the in the first half, um, you were we were, I was wondering, and I'm sure everyone watching at um, T squared social were wondering the same thing: like, is this curse really going to live on? Um, I will say. Just a quick side note, uh, Mike Breen, uh, I was watching the game, obviously, on the Knicks broadcast, very excited when uh, Mikael Bridges made that shot uh, because he has been on uh, NBA players for many years now for doing the whole like shooting the ball as soon as the buzzer sounds to not affect the field goal percentage. But as soon as that ball went down and excited, Mike Breen yelled, and that is why you shoot the ball at the end. Um, so, you know, uh, obviously cool uh, for him to see that, but. It was nice for everyone watching, um, you know, these uh, watch parties, they're, they're a big deal because it gets us obviously to see um, fans up close. You get to sort of hang out with the KFS group and just build the community that has been building over these last several years. So always nice, you know, win is not required, um, but certainly it is uh, helps with the vibes. So to finally get one after six straight regular season losses, um, I'm sure feels uh, really uh, good for everyone up there in uh, in New York. So exhibition continues. Thank you so much for that super chat. Juanan, thank you so much. Uh, always there to help support us. Uh, thank you again. Um, first, the Tibbs Love Fest article, then the a Amic uh, Fred Katz pod, and now this. The KFS meetup streak is over. Thanks to our pathetic little brother. Someone check Macri's pulse. Fire Tibbs. Hashtag. 53 wins. Uh, yeah, there was the, uh, obviously the, uh, uh, Amic ar ar article in the athletic about, you know, that how Tibbs, um, you know, maybe some of the things that we, we, we think about Tibbs as a old school coach and grinding players to the ground. Maybe that's a little bit overrated. Um, you know, we saw Dante DiVincenzo in the article, just talk about, you know, his practices really aren't that hard. Um, he does a good job of sort of balancing things. Uh, there was that poll, I think it was last year that it was referenced in the article about, you know, Tibbs being one of the guys you just wouldn't want to play for. But, you know, it's certainly true that the Knicks had built a roster of guys that fit his identity. Um, but to me, it's like that doesn't seem like a negative. That to me feels like we have a front office and a coach in, in that are have really a synergy right now in terms of what uh, kind of players are trying to bring in here. Um, and you really can't argue um, with the results. So, you know, I thought. You know, Tibbs over, I'll just like uh, kind of hit on this for, for a bit on his performance as a coach this year, because to me, it's been the best um, of his next tenure. Obviously the injuries are going to throw a wrench into a lot of your plans. And we've, there's been this theory out there that on both offense and defense, like Tibbs is very rigid with how he likes to operate. And to me, there's like two sides of the coin there where one he Tibbs certainly has his principles that he is not going to to waver on and it's defending the rim it's getting into the paint on offense it's driving and kicking it is the things that I think every coach if you're a coach on any level you're going to try to um you know be good at you want to defend the rim and you want to get into the paint get to the rim and then draw defense and and then your driving kick game sort of opens up those things are just tenets of his the way he likes to play basketball. And to me, that is not a guy of like, that is, you know, old school. That's not a guy that is rigid. That's a guy that just knows what the efficient looks are, which are going to be layups or dunks and what stopping those looks and are going to do. And that's going to you know, collapse the defense. And then you're going to generate three pointers that are going to be off the driving kick. Those are the three pointers that are the most efficient. It's not just every, obviously no three pointer to the next is, is created equal. It's how you get them. And, and, and usually coming off, a driving kick 
with a guy closing on you. So you can either shoot the ball if you have the space or then drive the close out and create more rotations on, on the defense. To me, those are the looks that really can benefit an offense. And, and Tom Thibodeau knows that. And that's what he wants his offense to do. And on defense, you're trying to stop that. So it's it's pretty clear that's what those are sort of like his guiding principles and how he views basketball. And then you have like, you know, you can't play for him if you're not going to defend. Well, to me, like that's seems like a completely reasonable way of operating. We've seen many coaches come through this town that have not, you know, apply the same sort of requirements. And we've know a lot of those guys didn't didn't work out well here. So to me, the fact that Tom Thibodeau is a demanding coach is you want guys that are going to want to play for a guy like that. And to me, most players want to be coached well. They want to be coached hard. And if a coach is well-prepared, which DiVincenzo again alluded to that in the athletic article of how prepared uh, Tibbs is as a uh, head coach, then you, to me, you're going to buy in. So, but beyond like the the guiding principles, I, f- I think his evolution of how this team has, has performed offensively has been really interesting to see because you start with Julius Randle and Jalen Brunson, and you're obviously going to run a lot of your offense through those two guys because they generate a lot of gravity. They, they, you, they generate a lot of mismatches. You're always, you're typically going to have either a Brunson pick and roll. We're going to get two on the ball or a Randall post up or an isolation, which a lot of times ends up with two on the ball. It's a very easy way of generating good offense because you're going to, if you make the right pass, you make the right read. And as uh, Tibbs says many a times, you know, the game will tell you what to do. If you just read the game based on how the defense is going to uh, play you, you drive, you kick, you generate three pointers, you get the defense rotation. You could pretty much get good offense from that. Now with Julius down and you have like now the one guy that left in Brunson, you're going to have to adjust a little bit. And to me, that's been the evolution of like where the team has gone and like how they've taken Isaiah Hartenstein, which remember last year, we, a lot of the, the talk after he got healthy, and he sort of became, in terms of his athleticism and his agility, the guy that we thought we were getting when and when the Knicks signed him. A lot of the talk was like, are the Knicks using him in the right way? Are they taking advantage of his his passing abilities and his his you know, the fact that you could run offense through him? Clearly, the Knicks didn't take full advantage of that last year. Part of that is, you know, he wasn't the starter for most of the year. Um, he wasn't the guy closing a lot of the games. He closed some, but he wasn't you weren't going to build your offense through him because it wasn't necessary based on if you had Randall, you had Brunson, you had the best off one of the best offensive rebounders in the NBA, Mitchell Robinson. You didn't turn the ball over and you had a really good offense. You fast forward this year and you lose your guys. Now you need to figure out what are our other ways to generate advantages. And Isaiah Hartenstein is your guy because what the Knicks have done and they didn't get a lot of, um, you know, they, they didn't generate a lot of great, generate a lot of great offense um, out of this today but generally speaking his delay action the fact that you could run offense dho's through him his passing ability his ability to hit cutters uh you know a 45 cut or a back cut like there's a lot of passes he could make has really benefited this offense as they try to add some creativity some some diversity um when you don't have julius Randle through isaiah hartenstein has been the avenue to to generate that and now he's developed this um ability to where if they're going to be so aggressive on these DHOs and try to take that away or they sag off him, he can dribble a couple of times, get into the paint and his floater, which, you know, early in the year, I was wondering like, is that shot like not going to be a valid weapon anymore? But you look at his numbers. I mean, from that like floater range area over 50% uh, uh, over on the season, that shot has been almost automatic over the past like several weeks. And it's a lot of that is, uh, Jalen Brunson getting into the paint and then Hartenstein doing what he does uh, well, moving without the ball, getting into a pocket where Brunson can find him and then hitting that floater. But Tibbs <clears throat> has done a nice job of using Hartenstein as a hub. He's gotten figured out ways to get to Vincenzo downhill, getting more looks. He's had to coach his way through this year to help keep this offense afloat until they hopefully can get Julius Randle back and get OG and OB back and, Back and staying back and not like going out again and getting these, getting your full complement of players to to try to make a run here because you look at this this team and how they're performing without those two guys now for you know basically since January 31st. Uh, although Ananobi, we know obviously came back a couple of games on the West Coast and then went back out. But to me, Tibbs has really had to coach in a way that is unique to, to you know how how it's been over the past uh, several years with with the Knicks who have enjoyed a lot of health. 
Um, they they lose Julius Randle and Tibbs has had to, I think, coach as well as he's coached um, since he's been here. So uh, shout out to him and shout out to uh, obviously the, the coaching staff in general, who this is, you have you know several um, coaches here on the staff. They all play a part in trying to figure out a way to generate offense when the team doesn't have natural playmakers other than uh, Jalen Brunson, of course, who uh, struggled today, but the Knicks were able to pick him up. So thank you, Juanon, for uh, that super chat. Anthony Sixto, thank you so much for uh, supporting what we do here. Uh, really, uh, a lot of gratitude, man. Thank you so much. Always like Deuce, but didn't expect this. On the verge of sky's the limit territory. Seems his biggest hurdle is in size, but sustaining confidence. Um, I did not expect this from Deuce either. You know, it's funny, like, Coming out of college in West Virginia, his three-point numbers were actually very good. And it it sort of gave it was the one area beyond his defense that you thought, like, all right, is it if this is a real thing and you factor in he's gonna the defense is not a lock to be a good, but there's a really good chance he's gonna defend in this league. And you you throw in, you know, an ability to shoot um a reasonable per- percentage from three, and then you're like, all right, that's a in the second round, like that's a really good find their potential rotation piece, right? That's to me, like sort of what I thought, like if he can just develop into a competent three point shooter, then he could be a rotation player in the NBA. Now you look at his percentages coming into this year. It's, it was under, I believe under 30%. The volume was very low. He never really got the, the requisite time to get a rhythm. And then as, um, Fred Katz pointed out in his article in the athletic, um, the shooting by McBride in practice, uh, Thibodeau has talked about this before where, you know, he's shooting um, as many shots in practice. I think Jalen Brunson is arguably the only other guy on the Knicks that that shoots as much, much as him um, in practice, that he's developed that three-point shot. It's something that was coming. And all he really needed was just the time to get that, that rhythm. And, you know, it's as a shooting, um, you know, a guy that really likes to analyze uh, shooting mechanics, you know, he's not someone that I would say is, um, you know, I don't think his mechanics are clean. I don't think his mechanics is, are, are, are one that I would necessarily teach someone. It's a high release point. It's a two motion shot. You know, if there's a lot of moving parts there, it's a high variable shot. I don't think it's, it's something that you can necessarily, um, gain a good rhythm with using when you're not playing a lot. So I think it's part of the issue with him is that because he has a, a you know, a very, you know, a, a shooting motion that presents some, some variables that can go out of whack and you don't have that rhythm. I think that contributed more than anything to some of his lackluster three point shooting in his first couple of years. But to me, it's like, you have to almost like look beyond that and just trust the percentages and trust the fact that, the Knicks clearly valued him as a shooter because I don't think they would have signed him to that contract if they didn't view him as a guy that was going to be a really good shooter in this league because it's it's, it's a prerequisite for him to be a good player because the the ball handling, um, some of the explosiveness, it, th- these are limiting factors, the size. These are things that can improve, obviously not the size, but like the some of the ball handling stuff and maybe he can get a little more explosive. But they're, they're sort of going to limit where he can go that you're going to have to bring in to the, to the mix here, a really good shooter and to do it on volume is really impressive. Now, I don't know if he's like a 40% shooter on, on, on these attempts. Um, there are you know, his per 36, three point attempts are at, at a high level right now, but I think that he can, his shooting is real and it's, it's a real weapon right now. And the fact that he can, he can get that release off with, you know, being guarded pretty tightly because he can, he actually jumps really high on his shot and he gets it off, uh, you know, way over his head. So you look at his release point, he's probably shooting more like a six, five, six, six player than a six, one, um, uh, player because of like where he, how much he gets off the ground and then where his release point is it's, it adds a lot of ability to get off a lot of looks because he's not like a movement shooter. Like he's not a guy you're going to, that's going to fly off screen. So you're not going to really get a lot of shots based on that. Um, so you're either going to do it off the catch and shoot, or you could do it out of the pick and roll, which we saw today, actually, where, you know, you're in drop and the defense is coming over the, the, the pick and roll defender is going over the top and you have that little window to pull up against that drop defender. He did it, um, today made that shot. And it's a, a look that I think that can be a real weapon for him and be a nice source of offense, um, for, 
for him as a pick and roll uh, score, which continues to improve. And as I look today, he's actually a really efficient pick and roll score for himself. Um, the volume is still pretty low, but he's, he's actually pretty efficient in these areas. Part of it is the fact that he's a willing shooter and a good shooter off that, uh, pull up now. Um, so just a really good development. Yeah. I don't know, you know what the limitation is with him. It's probably not the, the time to really discuss that to sort of break down, like how good can he be? Uh, he's certainly he's, he's performed well enough to where he's now going to be in the rotation. And he's going to play play up uh, uh, playoff minutes, and he's not going to play playoff minutes where you're just going to play him because you need to stop with seven seconds left on uh, in a quarter, and the and you're on defense because you want to get him on a on a good score and make it tough. He's a you're playing him because he's benefiting your offense now, and I, I do want to note the Anthony Sixto. You mentioned the confidence stuff. There was one, there is a couple of plays where it feels like yeah he took 12 three pointers, but I thought he can, he probably could have gotten 14 up. On the night, there was one where he swung at the Josh Hart. Uh, Deuce really had the better look, and he swung it for uh, a worse look, obviously a worse shooter. It's a shot that he could have taken from the corner, uh, and it would have been a reasonable uh, shot. It was the best shot the Knicks would have gotten on that specific possession here. But, you know, I think he's a natural connector on offense. He's really good at, um, generally speaking, he's really good at, at receiving that first pass. So the Knicks will break down – the defense, let's say Jalen Brunson getting into the paint, they kick it out to Deuce. The first rotation's coming out to him. Like he has a look here to make that shot. It's a good look, but he could he'll swing it one more if he's on the wing to the corner for a better look. He's he's really adept at making that that pass. And I feel feel like that's part of his natural uh, growth as a player to sort of decide like when to swing it, when to just take the look. Um, I think generally he's really good at at passing up good luck, good shots for himself, for better shots for his teammates. Um, but he's just been phenomenal. I don't, you know, they are just he is his growth as a as a score specifically has just been a revelation. Um, he and DiVincenzo, uh really for it, two different players, two different sort of paths to the next. But since Julius and o OG went down, they've had to take on more responsibility as scores, not just um, in DiVincenzo's uh, case as a spacer and maybe a second side pick and roll operator, like a, a guy you need to score some nights, you know, 20 plus points. Um, and then uh, Deuce McBride, it's like not just be a spacer, like get up a lot of three-point looks because we're not getting, getting a lot of uh, high efficient looks overall if you're not going to take 10, 12 threes if you're playing like today the entire game. So uh, big performance for him. Uh, Knicks have a guy uh, in Deuce McBride that is going to be on this team for several years now. And to me, as I said earlier, if you tell me that we have a backup uh, point guard rotation of Jalen Brunson and Deuce McBride for the next several years, I'd be very happy with that. I think that's a that would be a very good um, a starting point guard and backup point guard uh, rotation for this Knicks team. Anthony Sixto, thank you so much. David Funernick. Hey, how are you, man? Thank you so much for that um, super chat. Really appreciate it. A game willed by Dante, Deuce, and iHeart. What a showcase of the work Leon Rose and company have put in. Sometimes a Don does wear shorts. Um, now, you, I'm, I should get the reference there. I don't, so maybe someone can uh, can help me. I'm sure I'm going to get uh, killed for not knowing it. I'm sure it's like a completely reasonable reference, a completely a uh, worthy reference and one I should have just obviously received, understood, chuckled at, or made note of, but I can't because I am just, I am missing it. And I apologize. Um, so I will reference the rest of the, uh, your uh, super chat, which to me hits the nail right on the head in terms of uh, the role players, which was how I started um, the monologue here uh, today, because it's, they don't win the game, obviously without uh, those, uh, those three, um, the DiVincenzo performance inside the arc. I mean, there was a couple of finger rolls and performances. Um, Kev, thank you. It's a Sopranos reference. Um, Butternick, uh, he mentioned that in the, in the chat. Um, so one of the, one of the things I regret most in life is that I didn't watch the Sopranos. Um, I was late to the party there. It's like five years ago. I was like, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to watch them all. I'm going to just start it you know, episode one, season one. And I'm going to, I want to get these references. Like I want to be like, it's part of the culture. 
And then I just did the math on like how long it would take me and the hours it would take to watch them all. And I just, I gave up midway through episode um, one. So David, sorry, I'm, I've let you down in terms of your Sopranos reference. I apologize, but I did think it was either Sopranos or Godfather. Although I've seen, obviously seen, I've seen the Godfathers. Um, so it didn't ring a bell there. Um, but the Sopranos was actually my second um, thought there. So um Thank you for the super chat. I apologize for missing on the reference point, but just to wrap up the point here on the, um, on the role players, uh, DiVincenzo, uh, his, in that second half, uh, especially like, like getting downhill and finishing at the basket. Um, they were really running him off the line and teams have had success doing that. Um, and trying to make him a finisher. He finished today and they needed every one of those baskets, uh, late to, to pull this out. Um, I heart again, you know, it's like he's gotten to the level now um, over the past like two weeks, three weeks, maybe since like his Achilles is like sort of like iron itself out. And Knicks do have a minutes restriction on him. So when like his per minute production of late has been phenomenal, um, we have there's obviously the reporting that Mitch is working his way back in practice, um, getting close, hopefully. Um, we got the reports from uh, Fred Katz, or at least the indication based on just being in the locker room that it seems that Mitch is going to come off the bench, which to me is the only reasonable uh, choice there because you just can't remove Hartenstein from the starting lineup based on I, what I talked about earlier with like how this offense runs is based almost, you know, it's like Jalen Brunson is like the head of the snake. Yes. But it's like right below that, like the body of the snake is like Hartenstein's ability to make plays as a release as, as a release valve. And I've used that phrase for him several occasions over the past couple of years. But there's so many times where the Knicks will have the, their initial action. They'll maybe have like a secondary action and like nothing is really coming about. They're kind of stuck in the mud. And with like seven or eight on the shot clock, like Hartenstein will flash. He'll catch the ball. And like there are times where like nothing will happen and the, the possession will kind of sputter out. But he he'll he can sometimes generate like a nice back cut or a DHO and let, let a guy fly into one and, and get a decent look. Um, but there's times where, you know, there's a drive and he, while he's not like a spacer in like the, the traditional sense, I've always referred to him as like a really good mover without the ball and mover, not just, you know, there's like movers around the perimeter. If you're a scorer or a shooter, there's also movers like around, like he can, he can go from like dunker spot flash middle on the drive. So like that pass now becomes an option because of where he's positioned and like how he's moved without the ball. And that's something that, you know, Mitchell Robinson for all his, you know, greatness as an offensive rebounder and a finisher out of the dunker spot, like he's going to pretty much park himself there. And if that, if that drive is coming and he, he gets that, that drop off pass, like he could finish, obviously he's been doing that for, for not many years now, but if that pass to the, that dunkers area, which is like, you know, you think about it as, uh, sort of like the low block, but like right along the baseline on up either side, like that's kind of where you're going to park your non-spacing big sometimes. So if you're going to get a drive and you get that center to kind of come over and try to contest a shot at the rim, that drop off pass is there. Mitch can do that. But, uh, but if that pass is not there, Hartenstein can flash middle and he can just subtly move without the ball. He's not going like a large distance, but he's generating pockets to, and windows to pass the ball in. And Brunson who, his passing is to me is the area of his game where, you know, it leaves a little bit to be desired. Like he does, he can't make all the passes. He's not a, a great natural passer, but he's gotten better this year <clears throat> and he's gotten better specifically with bounce passes to Hartenstein, either the pocket pass when they blitz him or they hard hedge in the pick and roll, or when he's driving and he's got to dump the ball off to, to Isaiah. Like he's not Brunson is not a great lob thrower, but he's really good at, throwing accurate bounce passes, specifically the Hartenstein, who has really good hands. Um, something that, you know, if you compare him to Mitch, another area where the offense gets a benefit is that you have a center now that can catch those low to the ground passes, gather and finish, which he did a couple of times uh, today. So David, thank you so much uh, for the super chat. And um, sorry again for uh, missing on that reference. All right, Sam L. Thank you so much. Uh, for that super chat and for your contribution is deuce the best contract in the league dollar for dollar. It's a good question. Uh, do the Knicks have the four best in the league dollar for dollar in JB deuce Devo and I heart. Listen, 
as soon as you said dollar for dollar, obviously the guy I go to is is the player that's going to be an All NBA player, top ten in the MVP voting, and Jalen Brunson. He's probably you know there's probably a guy or two that you would say exceed him in the league right now. But excuse me, in terms of the the Knicks, I think you have to go uh, Jalen. But to me, this is testament to to what this front office has done to get guys not only that are good contracts, but have room to grow. Um, even DiVincenzo, who's like in, you know, he's 26, 27 years old. He's sort of in that area of his career where growth is potential. It's possible, but he's also like right on, in the beginning of his prime. So you wonder like, is is he sort of the player he, that he is? Um, I think the Knicks did a great job of identifying him because his roles as a player have not been as expansive as what the Knicks have, can offer him. And obviously some of that has been necessitated by the injuries, but even so, I feel like the, just the idea of starting him and allowing him to be the player that can space the floor beyond any player on the Knicks that can play, you know, some second side actions that can do a little bit more with the ball than I think uh, he was allowed to do in his previous stops represent a player that, you know, at his age, which I mentioned was like, is right on that cusp of like, all right, maybe he is who he is, but has potential to grow. That's the kind of player you identify. And that's a player that the Knicks, um, and you know, maybe the Knicks just thought they were getting a really solid player, uh, for the, you know, mid-level, um, contract, uh, to me there, you probably had a price in a little bit of potential growth because the Knicks were going to offer him a little more room to sort of explore his offensive skills. And you're pairing him with Obviously, uh, former college teammates, you, you, I think it was fair to assume there was going to be a little uh, chemistry boost uh, there. So him and then obviously iHeart, who is one of the better contracts in the league that's going to get infinitely more exp expensive as we head into the offseason. But I'm not going to uh, depress the vibes right now by talking about him potentially pricing himself, pricing himself out of the Knicks uh, range, although Jeremy Cohen has at least provided some assurance that, they, that there's a pretty good, a decent chance the Knicks are going to bring him back um, this off season because um, it would, it would just suck to lose him. He's a, as good a defensive player on a per minute basis as there's been. If you look at some of the impact metrics and you just watch him. I mean, there's so many of these like two on one opportunities where you have a roller to the rim and you just got to guard you know, the, the pick and roll uh, handler. He's got to worry about the, the roll man and he's deflecting balls. He's getting balls up at the apex. He's getting balls down low. He's deflecting. He's get generating steals. Um, his pick and roll uh, defense in general continues to get better as he's become more adept at like doing it. And, you know, I thought Mitchell Robinson was at a high level last year as a pick and roll, a defender. I think Hartenstein has actually exceeded his performance um, uh, this season, just re really great hands and, uh, does a great job of sort of disrupting things. Uh, when you think there's going to be an advantage, he's he's wiping it away with um, either a block shot or a deflection or a steal. So on a, again, per minute basis, phenomenal. We've, and, I, and I've talked about Deuce um, a lot. I could probably do it another 20 minutes. Just he continues to be one of these guys where, um, you know, he's becoming like a little bit of a fan favorite. And Mike Breen on the broadcast a couple of times talked about how there's now the deuce chant as uh, he they're anticipating the three-pointers going up. And there's there's sort of that thing building now where he's become such a good and such a high-volume three-point shooter that the team, the, the fans are sort of stored, uh, starting, excuse me, to buy into that a little bit. And and he's become, you know, I think you, you look at his like defense, every reason – in terms of like this Nick crowd to like fall in love with him. And then you add in, into that, like his ability to score now as an offensive player and as a shooter, um, there's something brewing here in terms of like how the fans and Deuce McBride, their relationship and like how they've sort of gravitated uh, towards him. I thought Mike Breen was correct to, to note that I did also uh, hear the Deuce chants uh, loud and clear. It was, um, it was kids day at MSG. So maybe they were just extra uh, vocal in that area. Um, but Deuce is just, he's becoming a really good rotation player. That's I, I can't, I just don't think there's a, you, even when you're healthy, you just can't take him out of the rotation. Like he's just too important, too good um, as a player right now, as a shooter. And um, that's not even referencing the defense, which is phenomenal. I mean, um, made everything that Cam Thomas took uh, difficult. Every shot he took, even when he was making them, he made things, uh, very challenging. Um, I thought his defense against Jamal Murray uh, started rough in the Denver game. And then 
sort of in the second half when Murray tried to exploit that matchup a little bit because I thought Murray really liked the Deuce um, matchup. I thought Deuce really held up well. Um, he had one defensive stop where he, he, he denied a post up and then Murray got it back and he immediately denied another one. And then Cam Thomas, again, just slowed him down, kept him in check. Another good defensive performance. A guy that you can probably feel comfortable can guard one or two on the defensive spectrum. Now, it's interesting. The key with him is like, could Deuce become a guy you can, as he gets stronger, can you can you put him on wings now and feel comfortable? Um, that to me is like the separator of like, are we talking about a good defender or on a permanent basis? Or are we talking about like one of the best guard defenders in the NBA? Because I think to be that, I think you have to be like incredibly disruptive, like a Jalen uh, Suggs, or you have to be a guy like Marcus Smart who can guard one through four, sometimes five, because you're so strong and sturdy. I don't, Deuce is not at those levels yet, but you know, you he's young enough to not, to get stronger, to get um, a little more stout as a defender. It's possible that he can sort of expand how good he is defensively, just based on his um, versatility as a defender. Right now he's, He's great. I'm not like saying this is like anything as like a criticism, but just looking forward, like that's an area where he can like actually become more impactful if he can be a little more, um, have a little more ability to guard up the line on defense. But right now, I feel great about him guarding any one, any two, and feel like he can put up a really um, strong effort and uh, limit that offensive player. So another uh, big game for him. Um, front office has been, you know, there's been some misses, but generally speaking, they've hit. You know, mostly doubles here. Um, haven't hit the home run yet, other than Jalen Brunson in terms of like bringing in that star player. Um, but you keep hitting doubles, you're gonna score a lot of runs. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna move the ball along. And I think this front office has done um, great work getting guys that are value contracts that have room to grow. Um, I think that to me, and it's a great point by Sam to sort of mention this. That to me has been one of the hallmarks to this um, front office is getting guys that are obviously you have the hardworking aspect of things, you have the shooting aspect of things, and then you have the ability to maybe have some untapped potential, which was there for Jalen Brunson, was there for Dante DiVincenzo, was there for um, Isaiah Hartenstein. Um, and those are obviously three of the most important players on this team. So uh, thank you, Sam L, for that um, super chat. Really appreciate that. Kevin Wilson, how are you? Thank you so much. Uh, we are um, indebted to you guys for helping us out here and Keep it as moving. Uh, love Deuce getting into the Steve no Novak zone in which the crowd starts to react before he even pulls up for three. Uh, yeah, I just talked about that and definitely noticed it. Uh, Novak is a great one to bring up because the crowd would, he would, he had a, he would get on such a heater where the crowd would almost like, it's like they were starting, they're preempting their cheer based on like just the fact that he was about to catch the ball and rise up into a, like a three, especially from like those corners. Like Novak was actually at that level as a shooter. Um, during his Nick tenure where he was almost an automatic um, shooter when he had space to, to rise up. Alan Houston was that guy. Like in the, if you go back to like the, the late nineties where such a high efficient shooter that you just knew um, if there was space to be gained and the Knicks uh, found him, the crowd could almost anticipate the shot going in and deuces. As I said, getting into that uh, range as Kevin um, as points out as well, um, excuse me. Um, the forty percent shooting on the volume is really a level that I don't think you could have reasonably uh, expected coming uh, to the season. Um, it's 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 one of those things where it feels real enough in terms of the shot volume. Um, and I don't have like the data. I know that there's there's a level of when three point shooting stabilizes. I think it probably stabilizes maybe a little bit sooner than 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 you think in terms of like where you are as a shooter. You know, how many attempts does do you do we need to feel confident that the level that you're shooting at is like that um, that level? Um, you know, maybe he's not a forty percent shooter, but if he's in the upper thirties at the volume that he's displayed, it's perfectly reasonable, and it's still going to be a highly valuable weapon um, to to continue to be a really good offensive player. Then the, like the next phase of like where Deuce could be is they're going to start running him off the line. There's times today where they would. And then how are you going to, to manage things based on that? Are you going to drive and, and make that pass? Like I'm really confident deuce as a passer that if he's able to get, get past that initial rotation, which you're closing on him, 
he's not gonna I talk about like burst being an area where it's not a high level skill for him and his handling, especially for point guards. Like if you're comparing to other point guards, it's not great. But you could certainly beat if you have reasonable ball handling and you have like decent athleticism and speed, you you could beat that that initial defender if they're gonna run him off the line. Then it's like you're gonna get in the paint and what are you doing with the ball? With that, are you gonna are you generating that the dump off pass? Are you finding another shooter? Like I, I'm really confident that he could be an expert uh, performer, beating closeouts and keeping the defense in rotation and finding better shots uh, for his teammates. So that just to me, to me is gonna come with more playing time. And that is like you you base you you think about like our, how are we projecting Deuce to be as a off ball scorer? Like you if you can get that part down, then you have like the high volume shooting. Then you have like a a defense run you off the line and then you're making them pay on the back end. Then you, you have a guy that could really do some damage as an off ball player that is developing as an on ball pick and roll operator. To me, there's been enough signs in that specific area that gives me a little bit of confidence that it could be something that you can go to and feel pretty good. He's going to generate a decent look for himself, um, especially shooting that pull up from three or uh, making that, uh, that read, um, He's actually pretty good making the the weak side corner pass, which, you know, he's got decent height and length, good wingspan. So maybe he's got a little more um, comparing at least to Jalen to, to see over the initial defense and getting that pass over to the weak side, which is not an easy pass for many guards to make that don't have like natural um, height advantages. So, but love the, the dues chance when uh, the, the shots about to go up. I think that's a really cool thing. Maybe, it becomes a, a routine uh, experience at MSG uh, for Deuce McBride, who continues to make shots and make shots at high volume. Big performance for him. Thank you, Kevin. Andrew Claudio, look at this guy coming in, reporting live from T-Squared Social just to say it's over. Yes, the curse is over. I'm 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 more happy than for any, you know, the one person I'm most happy for is like, you know, is that Andrew Claudio, like, the operation doesn't run without him. Um, I, you know, obviously you guys know there's, he's sort of like the guy that he he's on air, he's off air. He pulls, he's all, pulling all the strings on the, you know, behind the scenes and trying to keep this machine running, which continues to, to grow. And that obviously is going to add, you know, it's a great thing. It's an awesome thing that, that the growth is that we've experienced here, but it's, it's a lot. And he, he's, he's really handling it um, as good as you can expect. And um, he has a lot of good support. Um, with the KFS uh, staff to sort of help him build this thing out. Um, you know, Jeremy Cohen and um, all the, all the guys here that try to, you know, add to the, what this community is, which continues to grow. And I am just like over the moon, happy that I'm just a small part of um, building that and and helping that grow and being part of the community and, you know, these super chats and trying to, and doing things like this is like, it's a dream. You know, I grew up watching this team. So to be able to, watch a game and and then come on and like talk about it with you, with you guys after uh, a win is pretty phenomenal. And I'm sure for everyone back at um, T square social to be able to experience a win and feel that energy, um, which I'm sure is palpable uh, in New York city for a team. That's, that's good. And there's been many years of the Knicks being not good since, you know, the glory days in the nineties and um, you know, early nineties, late nineties, you know, that run. And then, the, the misery after that. So for KFS to sort of like continue to build while the Knicks are building, like it's, it's, I love that, you know, how we're growing uh, with the organization um, growing and just how the, 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 the synergy with that and, and how things are working out. Just, I can't be happier for everyone uh, that got to watch the game um, with other Knicks fans and be able to interact and hang out and, Get a win, man. It's, you know, 0-6 uh, when you do these live events or regular season, you start to think uh, think some things and you wonder, like, you know, how many of these can you go through and experience losses and to go home? And I'm sure they're fun regardless, but it's just the the sweet taste of victories. Uh, it, you know, I, all the, the beers and the bourbons that are flowing right now, I'm sure taste a lot better after uh, that win, which was a little, you know, scary there for, for a bit. Um, but the Knicks were able to sort of step on the throats of our uh, crosstown rivals and uh, put them away in the fourth quarter with suffocating defense and it's a nice shot making by the Knicks uh, role players. So cool experience, man. I'm happy for Andrew and all the guys at KFS and everyone that got to um, enjoy that uh, live. Really cool. Thank you, Andrew. Sam Garcia, can we take 10 seconds to laugh 
at the Nets. Listen, um, I'm not one naturally to to gloat. That's usually Andrew here. That's usually his cue to sort of like dual screen, uh, split screen, and and laugh and and make fun and and all those things. Um, not something I'm I'm naturally accustomed uh, to do. But listen, uh, the Kyrie KD s- stuff happened, and it sucked to be a Nick fan for for a couple of years there. Um, maybe not a couple of years for, you know, a year, whatever the heck that was, but for them to sort of go there and, and the, the nets to sort of have that moment of like, then they were chose the chosen ones. And, you know, obviously the hard and trade and like, is this team like a legitimate championship contender? And they probably were there for, for a stretch. I mean, those three, I know it's been talked about, but there was like, when they played, they were a, nightmarish group to to play against um obviously it didn't work out and the nets are back to this situation where you don't really know what their their vision is for the long you know short term or long term future i don't know how real the you know the mikhail bridges uh houston trade stuff that happened where houston was offering the nets picks back to them for uh mikhail bridges um i don't know how you know, if that was like legitimate or if that was something that was just reported, but I just want to see what he ended up uh, doing here. Uh, Bridges seven of 14, uh, 18 points, like a reasonable game for him, but there's never a point where you're worried about Mikael Bridges. And that's like, to me, if you're going to be a one, a, or like a guy that like a co-star, like you have to, you have to like, put fear into the off uh, defense of the uh, defense of the other team. And there's never an occasion where I'm looking at the nets and saying, or how are we going to defend Mikael Bridges? Like he's going to do what he does, right? He's going to take like semi contested mid range shots. He's going to take a decent amount of threes. Uh, yeah, he's, he's a reasonable scorer. Like he's fine. Like he's a, you put it, you, if he's like a third option on a good team, like that's a phenomenal player. But the Nets are treating him like he is a co-star with some other random co-star that's going to bring glory to this franchise. But I don't see it. And it doesn't seem like most, um, you know, unless you're a Nets fan and you are just like a stand for him or you're just like completely biased. Like, I don't think you can look at this player and say, all right, that is that is like a guy we build around. And that's like the thing that was like talked about. And I, and look, I, I think that is a loaded term nowadays build around has this like connotation that you're going to like make decisions and you're going to base all your decisions on playing on building a team with that player in mind. To me, Mikhail Bridges is not on that level. Like you want to build with him perfectly fine, but you need to get one or two guys that are better than him on your roster. If you're going to do damage. So the nets are in a weird spot and it's like, it's fair to, to wonder like what they're long-term outlook is like they have a lot of like decent players on the team that are like a reasonable rotation guys that are solid players, but they don't move the needle. And you know, to me, like how are the nets going to, going to do that? Like what's the, it doesn't seem like there's a plan going forward. And to me, if they had a chance to take a Houston offer where you're going to get multiple decent, good draft picks for Mikel Bridges, like to me, that might be one of those like trades that they, they decided to not pull the trigger on that. You're going to look back on and say, that was a huge, potentially franchise altering mistake there uh, to not take that offer. Um, because, you know, if you're going to get a star offer for a non star player, it just goes without saying you take that offer any day. So while I will not um, expressively laugh at the Nets, I will say that there are in some, you know, there, it's, it's a rough time to be a Nets fan right now. And I think that it just, it speaks to the idea of like when you are on top and they were on top for, you know, several months there or whatever the number of games was when you had KD and Kyrie and uh, Harden there, you were like, you were one of the teams that you had to worry about. And that run lasted a, a very small amount of time. And now it's gone. Now you have nothing except Mikel Bridges and you're trying to figure it out. And now it's weird. And now you have to wonder about, are you just going to be the little brother forever? And or indefinitely, and that's the part that is kind of funny. I, I can't lie. Like you, you were you were on the cusp of like taking that that mantle and and winning rings with star players, and it it got it blew up. And now you have no plan. You have Mikael Bridges and a bunch of like these ancillary pieces. Who, oh by the way, Mikael Bridges is also like an ancillary piece on a good team. So that's weird. And now you have to figure out what the plan is going forward. And it just doesn't seem like there's 
a good one for them. You know, I like, you know, they, I think they play reasonably hard. Like I think Kevin Ollie is a, um, I think they're five and 12 since they, then he took over. Um, I think he's instilled some competitiveness to this roster, but they just don't have a lot of good players and there's not a clean Avenue for them to get more good players. Uh, listen, they're going to talk about Donovan Mitchell. They could trade for Donovan Mitchell tomorrow and I'm not going to be worried about the nets. Like I'm just not. And that's like, not a, it's not a critique about Donovan Mitchell, who is a really good player, all-star player, like potential all NBA level player, but like Mikhail Bridges and Donovan Mitchell, and then you're trading a you know decent amount of like pieces off your rotation and you're trying to, and draft picks, like, what is that doing for you? What's the next move? And that's like the net where the net Knicks were, as we, we know, you know, before you got Jalen Brunson, it was you needed two guys and the Knicks got the one. And now it feels like they're at this point, And this is like the most frustrating part of these injuries is I, I look at this roster. I'm like, all right, you have a, a one, a star, you have a superstar in Jalen Brunson. You have another guy in Julius Randle who's an all-star. Then you have like this perfect complement of role players. So if you can get them all healthy, there's no reason this team can't wake up in June and be in the finals. Like there's just, I know Boston is Boston and they're an absolute bear of a team and they are the best team, but they could lose. They can lose before they get to the Knicks. They could lose to the Knicks. Like that's how good the Knicks can be when they have all their compliments uh, available and ready and healthy. Uh, which to me is like the most uh, frustrating part, but I'm not going to, this is, this is a super chat specifically to laugh at the nets. So I will just kind of like recap that and just make it about that. But I am very like frustrated that we're not, we have not yet to see the, the, the healthy Knicks since the January run, but the nets themselves, a lot of, a lot of weirdness right now for that organization. Um, I don't think Sean Marks is a very good, uh, general manager or president, whatever his uh, his tag his title is, I don't think he's performed at a level that is indicative of how he's viewed amongst the NBA media at large. I don't, you know, you look at you take away the KD stuff and the Kyrie, like you had to do that. I don't give, I don't fault him so much for that, but all his decision making beyond that, I don't think has has um, I don't think would inspire a lot of confidence in me if I was a Nets fan. So. Let's have some work to do. I don't really know where they're going to to try to get it done, but uh, to me, if they could have traded Mikael Bridges at the trade deadline for a, a good haul, I think it's a, just a terrible mistake to not do that. Thank you, Sam. Hush Z, um, thank you so much for uh, um, coming here and, and supporting us. And um, this is a good one because I haven't talked about this. So I appreciate, I think where this is going here. So Kemba Fournier and now Boyan feels like a pattern. Now uh, these Uber offensive, but no defense types of players just aren't a fit uh, for this team. Uh, so let's look at the minutes and Boyan played his seven minutes in the first half. And that was it. Now look to me, it's like, there's two aspects uh, to this um, where we have this offensive player that is not performing like a high level offensive player that was, that has been basically for years now in the NBA. That to me is like the struggle here because you, you're, you thought that you were, you were getting, you were going to get a guy that was going to struggle on defense, but you were going to make up for it. And then some as a really good high quality offensive player that was going to help bridge the gap until you get Julius um, Randall back. He's really bad on defense. Like really bad. I mean, Lonnie Walker had his way with him. Lonnie Walker had his way with him in the first half. To me, it was an alarming level of bad defense for Boyan on top of several games and now weeks of alarmingly bad uh, defense for Boyan, who, by the way, is just not performing at any sort of level on offense to make that um, a reasonable trade-off here. So, you know, I've done, I, I listen to a lot of, um, you know, national podcasts and there's this thought process for a lot of these guys, um, that don't want, clearly aren't watching the Knicks because they're like, why did the Knicks trade for Boyan, um, Bogdanovich and not, and why are they not playing him? Well, they're not playing him because he's just not good right now. And there's certainly the argument that 
when Julius comes back and Ananobi is back healthy, that it's he's going to fit better with this team because you can, if he's going to play in the second unit and then Mitch is back as well, you could sort of deal with some of the defensive concerns uh, because you have Mitch there just to clean things up, not Sims, not Achua. It's, I mean, it's completely reasonable. But then you're still left with the fact that his role on offense is, you know, his performance has not been good. The turnovers where he is, he, I liked his pick and roll ability in Detroit, but he gets t- and time and time again, he's getting, he's getting downhill and he's, he's sort of like driving without a plan. The defense collapse on him and he's just throwing the ball randomly out to the perimeter and he's turning the ball over when he's not turning it over the pass, if the pass does end up you know, in a Knicks um, hands, it certainly isn't generating any sort of advantage on that end. And so the, the, the possession uh, sort of dries up. I am, I think it's reasonable to make the connection to Fournier and Kemba. Uh, I think it's, it's almost like it's too clear a archetype, high offense, you know, great shooter, struggle on defense to not make the connection. Because what's going to happen is, and I talked about that early in the in the show, where Tibbs has principles, and one of them is like you have to def- not. It's not just trying. Like NBA players try on defense. It's rare that you get a situation where a a defender is just not trying. It happens, but it's rare. It's a lot more rare than I think people watching at home think it is. Like most NBA players try on defense. The problem is he's he's trying, but he's also just getting blown by time and time again. Uh, Lonnie Walker, there was one play where um, Boyan is on the weak side. So his his responsibility is to get down and uh, tag the roller. So he's coming off the weak side corner. The pass is going to the weak side corner. So now he's got to close out, which, all right, fine. You're doing your job. You're you're tagging. You're you're protecting the paint, right? And now your job is to, the, the you're trying to make them make that, crawl, that weak side pass because it's the longest pass and you hope you can recover. Okay, so now you're recovering. What's happening is at his age or his athletic ability at his current state, his he's just getting blow by, blown by in a way that is collapsing the defense. You can you can run at a guy and you can cause a drive, but you need to try to stay attached to them, to that player to try to make it a little more tough and allow your defense to sort of get back into their normal base defense to where you can defend the rim. His blow buys are so aggressive and they're happening so fast that it's creating great looks at the basket and that you just can't have, you can't have that. So um, maybe with Mitchell Robinson in the game, like his, his ability to clean things up is that, is at such a level to where you can manage that a little more, but you can't look at his performance right now and not worry about where it's going and where it could be, because um, I'm going to pull up what his minutes per game uh, over the past uh, few outings. Um, so we had seven minutes tonight. Um, let's see. And that's in 14 minutes in Denver, 17 in Golden State, 24 in Sacramento. So he's literally gone from 24 to 17 to 14 to seven. So if you're Boyan Bogdanovich, that is not a good trend. Your minutes have decreased in three straight games. And listen, when you're at seven, it can't go down much farther till you get zero. And to me, that's where I think this could be, um, headed un- unless Tibbs views and I think reasonably that with a fully healthy Knicks roster, his fit is uh, a little better, but, and you can throw Brooks in there too. You know, obviously the defense is, you know, he's less damaging defensively than um, Boyan, I think. Uh, but the offense has been probably more um, hurtful to your offense. I thought today the first half, I mean, some of the looks he was getting, he, he finally made one at one point, but uh, he was getting just phenomenal looks and just like, wasn't able to make them. So they, they have a problem here. I mean, the, the, the trade has been rough so far. You can't, you can't look at it and say anything different. Your only hope now as an optimist is to say when the Knicks are completely healthy, like these players fit more, but I think that probably applies more to Boyan than Burks because if the Knicks are fully healthy, like there's just no way you're going to play Burks over McBride right now. I just don't think you could do it based on performance. Obviously shooting is at least comparable. Like are, is Deuce like maybe a better shooter right now? Like right now, are you more confident in Deuce as a shooter? 
I'm certainly more confident in him as a defender, and I'm probably more confident with Deuce like running a pick and roll and getting a decent shot than name with Burks, who is if he's going to do that, is going to either generate zero advantage for his teammates or he's going to like dribble into a, you know a pull up uh, you know long two. Um, the best outcome is probably if they're in drop and he's just pulling up, which I actually like that shot for him. But teams are going to teams know that and they're not going to play conventional drop against Alec Burke because he is a really good shooter coming off um, screens and, and pulling up in that area. So, yeah, probably more confident in Deuce as an overall offensive player, which is saying something. And then the defense is just like unquestionably like a major edge for McBride. So I think if, if there's one of these Detroit guys that are probably staring at the abyss in terms of minutes, uh, it's probably Burks, but listen, if you're Boyan, like I think there's some there's some uncomfortable conversations he's probably having, like with himself, with his his you know uh, his team, with his you know people he trusts in his world to try to figure out a way to, to turn this because it's when Tibbs loses trust in you, it's just very hard to get it back. It's probably the one area where I just wish he was a little more um, less strict and just. Uh, when you, we know what happened with Grimes, where you fall out of favor, and it's just it's just tough to get it back. And I feel like McBride certainly has this trust. Um, I, I don't. I think Boyan is losing it. He's losing it quick. Uh, Twenty. I'm gonna say it again. Twenty-four minutes at Sacramento, seventeen at Golden State, fourteen minutes at Denver, seven minutes today against the uh, the Nets. So not a good trend. So uh, we'll see where that where this goes. Hush Z, thank you so much for the question. Robert W. Cross. Hello, DJ. Deuce will continue to surprise and delight in the playoffs. Count on it. Robert, I listen, I, I'm kind of with you here because I think we're going to get real Deuce minutes uh, in the playoffs, like real consistent 10 to 15 minutes a night. And I don't think he is. This is something I actually noticed last year in the playoffs. Obviously, the minutes were spotty and, and not consistent, but I felt confident with him on the court. And to me, that's like something that I don't know if that, if I'm sort of transferring my confidence into him in a way that's, you know, maybe misplaced, but I never felt like Deuce was overwhelmed by the moment. Let's put it that way. Like, I think, I feel like even in his limited action last year in the playoffs, I felt like when he was on the court, like he was a reasonable NBA rotation player in the playoffs that was going to make the right play. That was going to, make a shot for you that was going to play good defense. We're just going to keep the ball rolling. And this year, like there's just, as I've talked about a lot today, there's just more for him to, uh, to go on because in the playoffs, they're really going to hone in on your weaknesses and, and exploit them in a way that is uncomfortable for players. If you don't have a counter, I think Deuce is still susceptible to that because you just wonder against good defenses that are going to maybe uh, aggressively close on him and force him to make plays uh, as a a ball handler. It's a it's an area that I think he can certainly do damage in. But I will acknowledge, like if I'm writing a scouting report, like I am running him off the line all day every day, and betting on him making uh, plays uh, as a passer or a finisher at the rim. I feel like he's grown that way as a shooter to where I think that's the only reasonable option for them. But I am, I think he's a. I think he just makes winning plays in the way that you're you're not going to like worry about him making a play that's outside his growth area where he is as a player. I think he's got a really good ability to know his strengths and protect his weaknesses. And I feel like despite the fact that teams are going to try to take, uh, take away strengths and, and force him to put the ball on the floor and make plays, I feel like he can keep the ball rolling in that scenario, just keep the ball moving and try to get a, another shot uh, for his teammates based on the fact that they're going to be closing on him uh, really hard, especially out of those corners where he's deadly right now. And I think that'll be a major scouting report um, note for him. Probably number one on the scouting report for Deuce McBride is going to be run him off the line, pressure him on, on defense. If he's going to be running your point guard uh, and he's handling your ball, pressure him, try to take, uh, you know, this is an area that is a concern where you, you could pressure him. And while he's going to get the ball to half court, it might be with 17 on the shot clock or 16. And then you're, you're up against it a little bit. So I think that's, those are two areas where you could make things a little more challenging for him. But if he's playing with Brunson, 
if that's sort of like how you're going to pair things up or if there's going to be a, a, even against really good defenses, I, th- I feel like he could do enough uh, with the ball as an off-ball player to to be completely effective and a weapon as a shooter and as a ball mover and potentially as a guy that's going to attack some closeouts because that's that's the NBA this uh, nowadays. If you watch and you just focus on like how many closeouts there are in a game, I mean, I, don't, I never hand tracked it. It's a probably a good thing. I, I should do that next game. It's countless. It's like every play is generating a closeout uh, in the NBA. And to me, it's like, how are you winning those closeouts as an offensive uh, unit? And then how, on defense, like, how are you defending those? Is a lot of like how a lot of where these games end up going in terms of like who wins, who loses. Because if you could beat a closeout, and generate an advantage on the back end that you are going to get good shots. If you can close out and you can close out in a way that's um, reasonable, like if you have a, sh- a guy like Josh Hart, like you obviously you're gonna sh- you're gonna, um, you're gonna close out short on him, meaning you're not gonna run him off the line. You're gonna close, but you're gonna do it with uh, space so he can't drive that that lane. If it's Deuce McBride, you're gonna you're gonna close hard and try to run him off the line. And the Knicks obviously are very you know cognizant of that too, where certain players represent like certain closeout options where you're gonna you know, change things up and, and be very disciplined. And then also like, just have the ability to like stay attached and not get blown by like Boyan did. And to try to make things a little more challenging on those drives. To, to me, the closeout battle is, is so much of the NBA is that. And like, if you are performing better in these closeouts on a game to game basis, then you're going to have a decent offense. And tonight, or today, excuse me, I thought the Knicks had no fear of the Nets. So when their closeouts we're just generating another swing of the ball and then a, a late shot clock where on the Knicks end, DiVincenzo and McBride, especially I thought did a good job of shooting uh, against these closes, closeouts if they weren't um, tight enough or driving them and, and making plays um, as drivers. So thank you, Robert, uh, for that um, super chat. And I appreciate you always supporting the show. Zach Horowitz, uh, POG Hart blocks uh, uh, point of play of game. Sorry. Hart blocks Claxton put back when it was uh, close. Uh, yeah. I mean, there are so many of those um, Hart plays at the end where their momentum uh, changers. There was the offensive rebound uh, that he, that made it 97 84. So it was an offensive rebound by Josh Hart kick out to Deuce McBride hits the three makes it 97 84. And it was one of those, I mean, it was mic'd up uh, last year. I think it was game four against Cleveland where he says like my rebounds uh, break teams. And we was uh, on, on, on Mike talking to Mitchell Robinson about that. I'm paraphrasing something to that effect, but that was like another example of like where his offensive rebounds and his ability to like, see the de- see where the defense is and find the open shooter, which invariably you get an offensive rebound. There's going to be an open shooter somewhere. Like it happens so much. So he's just really good at finding uh, those shooters on the perimeter found deuce made it 97, 84 felt like that was one of the keys of the game. The block on Claxton uh, is put back another one where, you know, he comes out of nowhere and he gets a hand on the ball. You think claxon has got a free, you know, put back and going to sort of keep this game close heart deflects it. And the Knicks go back on offense. His, the way he turned the game with his energy was really like stood out. And in, to me, it's like when Josh Hart is just not playing at that sort of level where you know, maybe it was just the flow of the game where he just was like, it took him a minute to to kind of get back, get into the mix. But when he's not playing with that sort of intensity, it really stands out to me. Like it's, it's, it was apparent in the first half that there was something missing with him. And in the second half or most of the second half, it, the flip switch, uh, uh, the switch flip for him. And to me, it was, even though his, his top down numbers uh, weren't like eye popping in terms of like the scoring, like he only went, um, See here, I'm pulling that up now. It wasn't a an efficient game for him. Uh, three of eight from the field, oh of three from three, but he had 13 rebounds, five assists, um, plus 15 on the night in the plus minus. Uh, his energy, his uh, uh, spirit is just so key to where uh, this team is right now, and even more important potentially when they have their full complement of players back, and potentially he's now your sixth man. With, if, uh, praying Julius is back. Josh Hart is now your six man. And we all know the last time he was, he came off the bench was the Miami game where Julius got hurt. And that was the game uh, where Josh Hart just turned it around with his energy and his ability to 
change the the tenor of the game. Um, the Knicks don't really have that guy right now on their second unit uh, to do that consistently. So it'll be nice when and if the Knicks get their full complement of players and and Hart is back in that role because I think they can I think they can use that. But yeah, a, a nice performance by him, uh, Zach, and um, that play against Claxton is huge. And then the the three that he was able to get off the offensive rebound. Uh, which was one of the 26 points, as I mentioned earlier, the Knicks got on second chances to only three for the Nets. That is a massive uh, uh, gap right there. Uh, probably the, the the stat of the game, if you had to say one. Thank you, Zach. All right, Zach, again, thank you so much. Really appreciate you um, supporting us. Uh, Tibbs, there's nothing you don't love about Deuce. Yeah, I mean, there's we know that Clearly by the, some of the articles that have come out recently, uh, you could tell by the way uh, Tips talks about players. There's certain players that he just has an affinity for. Uh, there's been some reporting that he was, you know, one of the guys like really pushing for him to be drafted uh, a couple of years ago when the Knicks did draft him. He's a, he's a typical player. Not just, it's like, obviously the, the, the thing that jumps out is his aggression, his de- defensive ability, his, his motor, his conditioning level to play the minutes to play an entire game. And really there wasn't a point where it felt like he was dragging at all. Like his conditioning level is just at a level that's elite. So shout out to him. And that is going to, I mean, there's no coaching on any level of basketball in, in any league that is going to not fall in love with a player that can, that could do that. That's one. And to play with a sort of aggression and continue to do that. Um, Oh, Kev is make is making the point. This was chat was uh, was Tibbs post game comment about Deuce. So this is a quote from Tibbs, uh, quote unquote. There's nothing you don't love about Deuce. I mean, yeah. I mean, it goes to what I'm saying here is like there is nothing you don't love about Deuce. I mean, he is a first of all, he's like a great personality. He seems like a great teammate. I notice him time and time again, like being very positive on the court, like just generally a positive person, always clapping, always picking up his teammates literally and figuratively, and just being a guy that is going to be a positive influence, which listen, if you're not going to start, you're not a star player, like being a positive person to always like be smiling, to always pick your teammates up. That stuff matters. Uh, obviously matters a lot less than how you're producing on the court and your, your skill level, but it does, it does matter. Um, and so there's, there's like that, there's a conditioning, um, there's the ability to play the minutes he's playing his effort level, his defense, but there's something about Tibbs about, you know, that I think it's underrated a little bit is that he is, he's a modern coach in the sense that he just knows the value of good three point shooting. And he's not a guy that is going to take threes just to take them. Like there's, I talked earlier about the quality of threes and the best threes tend to be either off drives where you're getting into the paint or in transition. Like those are the highest quality threes that you can get generally speaking, like just swinging the ball around and, and getting up a three or taking threes off, you know, uh, a pick and roll where you're coming up and pulling up. Uh, there are a few guys that could do that at a high level. Most guys cannot. So your best three is going to be off uh, getting uh, after you get a defense in rotation or in transition where the defense is obviously not going to be matched up. So if you, if you look at that, we know Tibbs is, is key on that. His offense is based on that. And then you just need guys that could space the floor and be high volume quality High efficient three point shooters, and that's what Deuce is right now. Forty percent on excellent volume is going to just you're going to be in the good graces of most coaches, especially the guy like uh, Tom Thibodeau who knows the value of three point uh, looks. And to me, that is a big part of it. And the defense and the effort and all the other stuff certainly is a is a big piece to why um, Tibbs is sort of falling in love. Um, with uh, Deuce McBride and why I think that he is, he's in the rotation to stay. I don't think there's any way um, you can reasonably take him out of the rotation uh, this year and it'd be based on production because right now he's just, he's, he needs to be in, in the rotation uh, for the team uh, now through the playoffs. Thank you, Zach. All right. Ben Kim Gurvey. Thank you so much. I uh, always appreciate you uh, checking in. Um, big time uh, supporter of what we do here. Thank you so much as always, Ben. Uh, we've never seen this Knicks uh, squad fully healthy. 
Mitchell Robinson out in January. It's a good point. If uh, we ever get them all at once, yes, storybook season, hashtag storybook season. It's a good point. You know, I always talk about January being the, the team that was the Knicks fully realized, but, you know, Mitch obviously went out before that. And, you know, at that point, you didn't know if Mitch was going to come back this year. It's clear now that the odds are he's going to come back. Uh, what sort of Mitchell Robinson we're going to get is is obviously going to leave a lot um, – to be uh, seen on the court. Uh, it's hard to sort of predict that, but it's a, as it's crazy to think as dominant as this team was in January, that they really weren't fully healthy. That Mitchell Robinson, who is one of the better defenders in the NBA, the best offensive rebounder in the NBA wasn't playing. So there's, listen, I'll just say this, like the night, the Knicks or the day when they're all healthy and hopefully it's hap happens sooner than later. But that game where the Knicks have everyone healthy, the full roster is is ready to go. Like that, to me, that game, if it happens, um, um let's let's just be positive here. Let's say when it happens, when it happens, when the full complement of players, when they're all healthy and they're all playing, they're all in, they're off the injury report and they're all like ready to go. We get the alerts. Maybe they were on the injury report, and we get the you know the Fred Katz tweet that. X player is ready to go, a Y player is ready to go, and the Knicks are fully healthy. Like that'll be a cool moment. Like to know that the Knicks are fully rounded into shape and we could finally see like what what the ceiling is for the scene. Because it truly, I truly feel like there is a championship ceiling uh for this team because I think they have what it takes in terms of the the top end talent. And the and just like I think the perfect role players uh, for to play around Brunson to play around Randall. I really feel like you could wake up in June and find this team in the finals. I feel like they're that good. But the you know it's like the frustration part. It's like you just don't know on a day to day basis like what the the status is because with all three guys right now, unfortunately, uh, Julius. I'm talking about OG. We're talking about Mitch. Like there is there's question marks about what the what they're going to look like when they come back. If they're going to come back, if they're going to, you know, if, and when they come back, like, what are they going to, are they going to stay back? Is, are they going to re-injure something? Like there's, there's question marks, but the moment they're all healthy, that game is just going to feel really good. And I'm looking forward to that. I hope we get it. I think we're going to get it. And when we do, it's just going to feel pretty awesome to get the full Knicks roster, um, which, you know, again, credit to the role players today, picking up Jalen Brunson, say it again, seven of 24 for Jalen Brunson. The Knicks won the game. I think that's that's astounding. That's an impressive thing to do and to pull off for a guy. Um, I'm sure it feels good for Jalen, who I probably feels really crappy about his performance, but to to know that he's supported in the way that he is by uh, his teammates must feel must you know lessen the sting a little bit. Thank you, Ben. Really appreciate that. There he is. It's not a it's not a split screen, but we're going to get a ha 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 at the Nets from Andrew Claudio. Anyway, um, perfect man. I yes, thank you for doing it. I couldn't bring myself to actually laugh at uh, the Nets because I just I know how things turn in sports, and you never want to, um, you know, you just you just know it can turn really quick. And I'm just I'm as a Met fan, I'm weary of that. As a Knicks fan, I'm weary of that. So I appreciate you doing the honors. Uh, which you normally normally do in person, but you were doing it from uh, uh, T squared uh, social. So I, I appreciate that. Um, I'm, ho I'm hoping you had a good time today and we're got, got to celebrate a nice win with uh, your KFS friends, uh, KFS faculty and all the KFS uh, fans that came out and were able to share a nice victory uh, together with some good drinks, maybe good, decent food, good um, camaraderie, good company. And um, I'm sure all fun uh, was had by all. I uh, wish I was there, but happy to sort of, uh, you know, bring up the uh, the bench here and and come out here, allow you guys to to have this uh, moment, this victory, with the rest of the KFS uh, community, and um, you know, lend my uh, support here on this side of things. Um, but listen, big win today, really important. These next uh, four games were winnable games. The Knicks had to get get. They had to go minimum three and one, and the Knicks got the first one. So now you have you have three more against uh, winnable teams before this, the the schedule gets very tough uh, to to round out. 
hopefully after these uh, next three, you get we have a semblance of health, maybe our full complement of players, which is uh, continues to be a big theme here. But if we can get everyone healthy, I think there's a, a pretty large ceiling uh, for this team. But thank you for everyone to to come out and support um, here uh, with the super chats to come out and support everyone at T Squared Social. Uh, it's I'm sure it was a great event there. It was great to be here with you guys to celebrate this win, talk about it, sort of uh, figure it out, take your super chats. Um, thank you, Kevin, um, pushing the ones and twos on the, in, on the um, behind the scenes, uh, keeping me going here. Thank you so much. I'm glad to have you with the the team. You're a, you're a newer member here. Um, it's been great to have you, and I appreciate you uh, supporting me um, and producing this show. Thank you so much. And thank you guys, um, obviously, for tuning in. Please like this video and some, subscribe to our channel. That alone does a, just a great um, amount of help for us to help spread the word and and just um, support the channel and try to build our uh, exposure on YouTube and trying to uh, do more here and uh, doing more content for you guys. It does a It's a really big benefit to us. So thank you for liking this video, subscribing to our channel if you haven't already done that. And if you're listening on the KFS podcast feed later, leave us that five-star review. Those things go a long way to help spread the word and, and get, get us more... Um, ears and eyes onto what we do here um, and leave a review if you are uh, so inclined to, to help uh, spread the word. Thank you guys uh, so much. Thank you to, again, to Kevin and everyone that um, helped support the show today with the super chats. Really appreciate you guys. Thank you. Have a good night.